Welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church in Atlanta. For our members, please keep track of all our news and updates through the Tuesday and Sunday e-blast. Next week, June 21st, we will still be online, but the choir, lay reader, and I will be coming to you live from our sanctuary. The service will be at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning on Facebook. You must join us live because the recorded version will not be able to be uploaded until the next day. So now quiet your hearts and open your minds and let us join together as we hear God's call to worship. Psalm 4 reminds us, when you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. There are many who say, Oh, that we might see some good. So let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. We have a great high priest who can sympathize with our weakness, Jesus, God's Son and our Savior. Therefore, with confidence, let us confess our sin. God of justice and mercy, we confess that we put ourselves first and trust in things that will not last. Sometimes, without knowing it, we desire the evil 
and scorn the good. Often we gather up power and wealth and are oblivious to the needy in our way. O oh Lord, be gracious to us in spite of our sin. Teach us to love your justice and share in your mercy. Help us to seek the treasure of living as a citizen of your kingdom on earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. But God proves his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So take this message to heart. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now share this good news with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. The peace of Christ be with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. The peace of Christ be with you. May the, May the peace, peace of Christ, Christ be with you. Peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Before the gospel lesson is read, let me introduce why I chose Mark 3, 1 through 10 for today. Friends have asked me why I'm not speaking out more about the protests, Black Lives Matter, the injustices we're seeing of systemic racism, all that's boiling up around us. Why am I not posting more on Facebook? And my immediate answer is I'm hesitant. I've been to some of the protests lo locally and online and follow the news carefully. I've worked in ministry efforts for racial reconciliation for over 30 years. I've read a lot over the years and learned a lot. However, I'm hesitant because I'm white and a man who sympathizes but cannot begin to know what racism is truly about. I grew up in some of the most segregated towns in the Deep South. I'm aware of many of the ways I've benefited from a system that favors whites and men, which now we call white privilege and therefore I am hesitant because I can't pretend to be an expert or to say what is happening or needs to happen. And I'm not going to post much on Facebook because I don't simply want to incite those who disagree. But I also don't want to err on the side of being silent and implicitly condoning the injustice. So I was puzzled with how to preach this week in deciding on a sermon topic, I began with a continuation of the work I mentioned two weeks ago that Father Richard Rohr brought up in his daily email devotions as he looked into the liberation theologian Paulo Freire, who wrote Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Freire is a mentor of my close friend in ministry in northern Brazil, Manuel Andrade, who's been to our church and who is changing Brazil through education, just as Paulo Freire advocated. The first step in changing the world is a conversion to show solidarity with the oppressed through forming friendships across socioeconomic, political, or racial lines. The second conversion needed is anger. To let yourself become angry against the systems and issues that are oppressing your newfound friends. That righteous anger is what I see solidifying today across our country and world against police brutality and killings with no accountability 
and even opening our eyes to the racist DNA embedded deeply into many of our long-held policies, laws, and systems in our land. So I thought we would focus today on this anger that is manifested in itself throughout our nation and world, but also causing an uneasiness or fear of further riots and violence that raged out of control last week. I looked for a passage in the Bible today that dealt with anger. It's easier to choose an Old Testament passage such as the incensed prophet Amos shouting about God's anger that God hates and despises our solemn worship assemblies, which concludes with the verse that Martin Luther King Jr. is most remembered for, so let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. The black church has also oriented toward the Old Testament figure of Moses and his march for liberation against Pharaoh. But I wanted to find a New Testament passage and a story of Jesus getting angry and protesting. We all tend to immediately think of the one obvious time Jesus lost his cool by overturning the money changers' tables in the temple. Even Jesus got angry, we conclude. But I did not want to choose that story this morning because that focused on Jesus' anger over a, an internal religious matter. They were turning his father's house of prayer into a den of thieves and using religion for monetary gain. But it did not address political issues of abuse in his city. Where is a passage about Jesus getting angry over injustices like Amos or Moses? Without the Old Testament, it seems difficult to find a passage that directly shows Jesus making political statements. I do realize we have sanitized his message to be concerned with personal matters of our religious piety or ethical behavior. We easily see that Jesus called us to be compassionate to all, to love our neighbor, to live a life of moral integrity. But did Jesus get angry and protest and directly dress political oppression. So I looked up all the places in the Gospels with the word anger, and I stumbled upon Mark 3, verses 1 through 10. The story of Jesus uh, defined the Pharisees by healing a man on the Sabbath. I always thought this was a story about Jesus calling the religious leadership out for being too legalistic and showing them a correct interpretation of Sabbath observance but I was surprised to find in studying the passage that it refers to Jesus becoming angry over political injustice. Well, listen to the scripture lesson today and consider why is it Jesus is so incensed? Again, Jesus entered the synagogue and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Jesus was angry and grieves because the Pharisees' hardness of heart. At first, this seems like an internal religious matter, just like the story in chapter 2 when the Pharisees got indignant of Jesus picking grain with his disciples and not fasting on the Sabbath. And Jesus scolded the Pharisees and shamed them, saying, The Sabbath was made for humanity, not humanity for Sabbath. But that was a scolding for misguided religious practices, right? They were applying their religion incorrectly. That, that was not a protest over great injustice. Our passage this morning in chapter 3 Jesus scolded these same Pharisees, inferring that they were seeking harm rather than good, and even killing rather than saving life. This was not an internal religious matter. In verse 6, it says the Pharisees then conspired with the Herodians, King Herod Antipas's government, 
in order to kill Jesus. This was a mix of religion and politics even from the beginning of Mark. The Pharisees were representing the ruling class, including the political government that was using their laws, both religious and political, not for the good of the people, but for harm and even for killing. They disregarded God altogether. That notion is reinforced when we realize that Herod had unjustly imprisoned John the Baptist already with no lawful reason and was about to execute him. Jesus was angry and grieved over their hard-heartedness, but it was not simply about the temple practices that had gone sour. His anger was speaking in protest to the religious and political leaders for their brutality and injustice, especially toward the poor and the weak, the voiceless ones like this man with the withered arm. It was a protest. At that time, Jesus was a one-man protest against the system. Just like John the Baptist, Jesus knew his political protest would meet with fury and backlash and even death, but he marched ahead with only a small following. At this point in the book of Mark, the text shows foreboding of what lay ahead. Just as Jesus accused the Pharisees, he knew it would cause him harm and even be being killed because he was speaking the truth against the political systems of power that oppressed his people. His solidarity and anger were slowly coalescing a movement, you may even say a revolution, but slowly and over time, raising up the ordinary and the powerless. These past two weeks, the death of George Floyd seemed to be causing a tipping point, as Malcolm Gladwell might call it, a sense of solidarity across racial lines. It's like the scales were removed from our country's eyes to see what for black folks and for some others was grossly obvious for decades, especially in the past years of so many atrocities caught on camera. Today, there seems to be a recognition of the obvious racial systemic bias and prejudice, though it's not certain whether the anger and protest and where they'll lead. In order to project where this might lead, where the Spirit might be leading our country, and in order to have hope and find some direction for where might Jesus be calling us and where He's calling us to, to act, I look to our city and our own Atlanta's prophet, Martin, and his reflections entitled, The Summer of Our Discontent. Uh, it's a, a reading uh, that's uh, a paragraph in the book of Why We Can't Wait. Reading it sounds like we're reliving history all over again. He reflected on turning points that began in the summer of 1963 when Bull Connor's police force brutalized the peaceful protesters in Birmingham, when George Wallace stood in the doorway refusing to allow the University of Alabama to integrate, and the tipping point of the bombing of the little girls in Sunday school in the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. I want to read excerpts tracing King's train of thought in this essay and give us a sense where our country might be heading today. MLK's words have a parallel with the events of Jesus and His ministry as Jesus' disciples looked on with fear and foreboding, worrying about where the movement of God's messianic Savior was headed after our gospel in Mark 3. So here this condensed version of the excerpts from King's the summer of our discontent. In the summer of 1963, the blacks of America wrote an emancipation proclamation to themselves. They shook off 300 years of psychological slavery and said, we can make ourselves free. For hundreds of years, the quiet sobbing of an oppressed people had been unheard by millions of white Americans. The bitterness of the black lives remote and unfelt, except by a sensitive few. Suddenly, last summer, the silence was broken. The lament became a shout and then a roar for months. No American, white or black, was insulated or unaware. The stride toward freedom lengthened and accelerated into a gallop while the whole nation looked on. 
It would have been pleasant to relate that Birmingham settled down after the storm and moved constructively to justify the hopes of many who wished it well. It would have been pleasant, but it would not be true. After partial and grudging compliance with some of the settlement terms, the 20th century Knight Riders had yet another bloodthirsty turn on the stage. On one horror-filled September morning, they blasted the lives from four innocent girls studying in their Sunday school class. Police killed another child in the streets, and hate-filled white youths climaxed the day with the wanton murder of a black boy harmlessly riding his bicycle. These were terrible deeds, but they are strangely yet less terrible than the response of the dominant white community. They hoped that a sense of atonement would quicken the pace of constructive change. The hope was destined to die a cold death. Instead, the small beginnings of goodwill seemed to wither. No white faces could be seen at those girls' funeral, save for a pathetically few courageous ministers. More than children were buried that day. Honor and decency were also interred. In assessing the summer's events, Martin Luther King continues, some observers have tended to diminish the achievement by treating the demonstrations as an end in themselves. The heroism of the marching, the drama of the confrontation became in their minds the total accomplishment. It is true that these elements have meaning, but to ignore the concrete and specific gains in dismantling the structure of segregation is like noticing the beauty of the rain, but failing to see that it has enriched the soil. The social movement that only moves people is merely a revolt. A movement that changes both people and institutions is a revolution. The summer of 1963 was a revolution because it changed the face of America. Freedom was contagious. Its fever boiled in nearly 1,000 cities, and by the time it had passed its peak, many thousands of lunch counters, hotels, parks, and other places of public accommodation had become integrated. And King continues, There is evidence that the revolution is now ripping into our roots. For too long, the depth of racism in American life has been underestimated. The surgery to extract it is necessarily complex and detailed. As a beginning, it is more important to x-ray our history and reveal the full extent of the disease. The strands of prejudice toward blacks are tightly wound around the American character. The prejudice has been nourished by the doctrine of race inferiority. Yet to focus upon blacks along the inferior race of America myth is to miss the broader dimensions of the evil. King continues, To those who argue that blacks are becoming too aggressive and that their methods are alienating the dominant white population, there is a convincing answer. The striking result of the survey of 1963 disclosed that overwhelming majorities favored laws to guarantee blacks voting rights, job opportunities, good housing, and integrated travel facilities. These majorities were found in the South as well as the North. The summer of our discontent, Martin Luther King says, far from alienating America's white citizens, brought them closer into harmony with its black citizens than ever before. So we are not swimming in the midst today I am saying, of our own summer of discontent, are we not? For too long, many have hoped that the horrific brutality against black lives would quicken the pace of the constructive change, but the hope was destined to die a cold death today. Instead of the small beginnings of goodwill, they seem to wither. With all our country's protest for Black Lives Matters, Remember a, quote, social movement that only moves people in is merely a revolt. A movement that changes both, both people and institutions is a revolution, end quote. King said, there is evidence that the revolution is 
now ripping into roots. And it's, it's so, so uh, familiar and right on today. For too long, the depth of racism in American life has been un underestimated. The surgery to extract it is necessarily complex and detailed. As a beginning, it is important to x-ray our history and reveal the full extent of the disease. Yes, we must learn from history and move forward with dismantling and rebuilding today as well back as 1963. Today, the summer of our discontent in 2020, far from alienating America's white citizens and black citizens, it is bringing us closer into harmony closer than ever before. But, quote, the social movement that only moves people is merely a revolt. A movement that changes both people and institutions is a revolution. And I say Jesus was a revolutionary. Jesus did not shy away from speaking the truth against his own faith leaders and those in bed with the oppressive political hierarchy. He called for followers and calls for followers to show solidarity with those who are oppressed, jobless, and voiceless like the man with the withered hand, to voice our anger, and to expect kid kickback and hardship. Rest assured that Jesus and our faith are not simply trying to save souls from suffering on earth, nor are they trying to simply move people to merely revolt. I truly believe that once again we are at a tipping point when the Holy Spirit has stirred a movement that is changing both people and institutions. So take hope because we today are in a sloppy era of a revolution. But God's help and by God's help, it will be a revolution of love and not harm, of saving lives and not killing of deconstructing institutions and replacing them with liberty and justice for all. Have hope. Amen. In the prayer, when I say, God of mercy, you say, be gracious to us. So let us pray. Sometimes the troubles of the world seem impossible to address, and the burdens of our lives seem too much for us to bear. Yet we trust that for you, O God, all things are possible. You alone can save us and our world that seems so out of control. Therefore, we are bold to pray to you, saying, 
God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray for peace in our cities, for justice to those whose voices have been clamped shut, for their anger to be heard as desperate pleas for what is right and fair. God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray against violence of any form, whether someone protesting in rage or a police officer using excessive force for anyone abusing the freedom or rights of another. God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray for the tables of the poor to be filled with an abundant harvest that no families would lack for basic necessities. God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray for an economic recovery that quickly returns jobs to those desperate for a paycheck. God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray that you would keep us healthy and safe, O oh God. Keep us conscious to protect those who are most vulnerable from the coronavirus. God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray for our church and our friends we long to see. For those on our list of joys and concerns, Kate, Justin, Nora, and Price Calusi Estes, Katie, Waite, Molly, and Jack Allman, Sam, Janet, and Chris Kellett, Allison and Wright Kaufman, their granddaughter Elizabeth, her parents Shara and Rob, and her sisters Helen and Margaret, for Dorothy Brown and her sister Mildred, for Carol DeMar's infant grandson Leonardo, Susan Conger's family on the death of her mother, and Edward Lloyd's family on the death of his mother, for Luann Miller's parents, for Charlotte Cook's great grandbabies, for Mercedes Mondekar, for Nancy Bryant and Linda Ellers Jones, as well as Matt Alamani's mother, all recovering. For our graduates, Katie Lloyd, Matthew Price, and Jazzy Hoffman. For our newest members, Laura Smith and Clint Smith Sitton, for Marion Wasden, and for Susan Lee English, who has returned to town. God of mercy, be gracious to us. We pray all these things through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
May God bless your eyes with sight that you may see Christ's face in every living being. May God strengthen your soul with courage that you may never fear the forces of hatred and division. May God fill your heart with love that you may go forth to do the Spirit's work of peace and reconciliation. Amen. Thank you.